We're glad that you've decided to join us here at Woodland. My message this morning is dependence. Uh, You know, last week we celebrated our independence as a nation from the King of England. And today I'd like to talk about our dependence as a people to the King of Kings, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, But before we do that, at a little side note, I'd like to share that today is my 29th wedding anniversary with my beautiful wife, Kyra. And I depend upon her every day. (laughs) Uh, I can remember as a teenager taking a part in the trust fall. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You know, where you gathered your friends together and they blindfolded you and you had to fall backwards and you trusted that they would catch you and you wouldn't hit your head on the floor no matter how soft the carpet was. So, you know, it's not so bad. You just begin to lean back a little bit and you expect to feel their hands. Uh, Nope. You go a little bit further. Uh, You know, you start to worry and then, you know, it's like, all right, point of no return, do or die. You just kind of buckle your knees. It's like, no, nope, I don't trust you guys. I'm getting up. And they said, oh, you were so close. We would have caught you. Would you have? Well, it came down to whether or not you could depend on your friends, right? It's what it all came down with. You know, when uh, Philip and Melody were young, and uh, we'd take them to the park off, and they They just loved being at the park, and they loved the monkey bars. They would just run up and down the monkey bars like monkeys. Uh, But, you know, why why go down? Why climb down when you can jump down, right? And I could hear my daughter say, Daddy, catch me! Catch me, Daddy! Catch me! And I was in better shape then, but, um, yeah, I would would catch her. And, you know, she, she depended upon me to catch her and not let her fall. I never let her or Philip fall, just so you know, for the record. Um, But, you know, they were trusting that I would catch them. Uh, I also remember a week, um, or following a week of marching band camp. And if any of you know Woodhaven marching band camp, it's an intense week of marching band camp. Uh, Near Port Sanilac off of Lake Huron. Uh, Afterwards, our family visited the historic Swinging Bridge in Crosswell. Uh, just west of, west of Lexington. And let me tell you, it, it lives up to its name. <laughs> it, it swings, it moves, it, it, you can have people on the other end and they can bounce each other off. And yeah, it's, um, but when I came to that bridge, I wanted to test it. I wanted to know if, if I could trust it. Could I trust this bridge um, can I rely on this bridge to, to bear my weight and, you know, so that I don't come crashing down into the river below? Um, it's one of those things that we need to do to, to test and to see that something is good, something is reliable, something is trustworthy. And the Lord Jesus himself said, taste and see that I am good. He wants us to... To, to trust him, to know that he is good, that we can count on him, that we can trust him. I love reading, um, looking up words and reading from the Noah Webster first edition, American Dictionary in 1828. Things have changed so much. Uh, Noah Webster in his 1828 dictionary would, would often use scripture to give examples of word usage. And when I looked up uh, the word depend, uh, it's no different. Uh, Noah Webster in 1828 uh, defines depend as to hang, to sustain by, or uh, to be sustained by or attached to something above, to be connected uh, with anything. And then he gives this example. We depend on God for existence. Now, you won't find that uh, in many dictionaries today. He writes, we depend on God for existence. You know, the etymology of, uh, of the word depend is from the Latin word pendere. It's where we get our word pendant from, which, of course, is a flag that 
hangs down. It's a, a flag of identification that's hung from a ceiling or a wall. And that pendant comes from Pendere. We hang pendants to show which sport teams uh, with which we're connected. You know, if I were a Lions fan, I would have a, a pendant with the Lions hanging on my wall. And people would see that and they would know that I'm connected with them, that I am um, somehow belong with them, that I'm identified with them. I'm a fan. Well, we need to be a fan of Christ, so to speak. But even more so, we need to be connected to Christ. We need to be sustained by Christ, attached to Christ. And that's what that word depend is. We need to be so connected with Christ that it says the example that Noah Webster gave, our very existence depends upon Christ. You know, another word for depend is rely. And rely comes from the Latin word re ligare. Ligare is, is a word meaning to bind, to bind. Those of you who are replayers, saxophone, clarinet players, you know that you use something called a ligature that binds the reed to the mouthpiece. Now you know why it's called a ligature. <laughs> It binds that reed to the mouthpiece. We, we get our word oblige and obligatory um, to make note of a, a binding contract. Well, don't you know we ought to be bound in Christ? Bound in Christ. To depend on Christ means to be connected to Christ. To rely on Christ means to be bound in Christ. There is a connection. There's, there's communication but there's trust. And trust involves faith. You know, trust is synonymous with confidence. And confidence literally means with faith. Con, fidere, with faith. And from that word, we get the word trust. So the question is, in what or in whom do you place your trust? When Philip and Melody were climbing on the monkey bars and they jumped down, it wasn't so much that they trusted that they would be caught or they had faith that they wouldn't fall. Their trust was in me. Their faith was in me. That I would not drop them. That I would catch them. Their dependence was upon me. Suppose I embark on a transatlantic voyage and um, I get my canoe expertly crafted by uh, Anna Meckart who designed and built the canoe. He's, a, he's an expert woodsman. And, uh, you know, I have my paddle and I have that canoe and, you know, I have the utmost faith that I'm going to make it across the Atlantic Ocean in that canoe. I mean, the utmost faith. I couldn't have any more faith. I have all the faith that I can muster. I'm probably not going to make it. I'm probably going to die, right? I'm going to drown no matter how great a canoe that Adam builds, which he makes fine canoes. Um, it's not my amount of faith in that canoe. It's the canoe. Sorry, Adam. Now, if I boarded an ocean liner... How much more confident would I be making across the ocean in that giant ship, right? I would only need a teensy-weensy little bit of faith, right? Because my faith is in that huge vessel. The point is, it's not my faith, and it's not how much faith, but it's in what I put my faith that makes all the difference, this is why Jesus says, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible for you. What's he saying? He says it in Matthew 10, 26. With God, all things are possible. With God. Not with my faith, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. It's my faith in God. He does the work. In my illustration, my dependency was not upon how much faith I had, but rather was dependent on the trustworthiness of the vessel with which I crossed the ocean. And we know that Jesus is completely trustworthy. 
He is completely trustworthy. In fact, the very word worship comes from the word worthship. And we worship God because he alone is worthy of our praise. Are you trusting in Jesus? Is your faith in Jesus? One way to answer that is to ask yourself, how much do I rely upon Jesus? Am I bound in him? Or put another way, to what extent am I dependent upon him? How much am I connected to and with him? Look at what the scriptures say. Isaiah 12, 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. God is my salvation. I will trust. Jeremiah 17, 7. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord, and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. Confidence with faith, trust in the Lord. You see the interplay between trust and faith. Our trust, our faith, our confidence is in the Lord. Now this morning I want to look at two things upon which we can depend. First and foremost is our dependence upon God, the rock. And secondly is our dependence upon one another, the little rocks, or the church, built upon the rock, founded upon the rock. So let's look at the first. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my rock. Let's say that together. The Lord is my rock. You know, God is, is called the rock often in the Old Testament. And I'd like to share a few scriptures with you. In Psalm 61, beginning in verse 1. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. God is the rock. He is a refuge. His strength protects us, guards us. Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. How glorious is our God. He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright he is. He is the rock. And finally in Isaiah 26, 3 through 4. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. Boy, don't we, don't we need peace today? Boy, you listen to the news, it's everything but peace. But God will keep in perfect peace all who what? Trust. Trust in him. All whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal Rock. Let's read that last sentence together. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. Trust how often? Always. Just when there's a crisis? Just when the sky is falling? No. Always. Trust in the Lord. And we can depend upon him because he is the what? Eternal rock rock, immovable, immortal. You can depend on the rock that does not move. Okay. Let's say I believe God is dependable and I believe that I need to depend on him to get into heaven when I die. All right, I, I get that. I can't get into heaven without him. I depend on him to get into heaven. But I'm not dead yet. So why do I need to depend on God 
now. I mean, why the need to depend on God now? I mean, he's there when I need him, but maybe I don't really need him right now. See, it's so easy to go through life just casually unaware of our need for God. Picture two guys that just happen to bump into each other at Kroger. Hey, Sal. What's going on? Not much. How about you? Doing all right? Can't complain. Yeah. Me neither. How's the missus? All right. Got to pick up a few groceries. Yeah. Well, it's good seeing you, Frank. Yeah, you, you take care there, Sal. Sorry, men are just, you know, the ultimate conversationalists. <laughs> I are one. <laughs> But I mean, you're just kind of going through life, coasting, you know, life is good, you know, can't complain, nothing much. You know, we don't think about God unless there's an emergency. When life is good, when we can't complain, when the sky isn't falling and our basement isn't flooding, God is like out of sight, out of mind. Ever feel like that? Probably a lot of people, good people, Christians and non-Christians alike, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And, you know, the more censored that, that God becomes in, in the public square, in our society, the more easy or the more easily it is to not think of him. And that's why Christians need to be more public in their demonstration of love and of charity an acceptance of others. So I'd like to propose three reasons why we need to depend upon God. Yes, we need to depend upon God. And three reasons I give all begin with the letter S, so I'll help you to remember them. The first is salvation. Now, that seems kind of obvious because there is no name under heaven or earth by which we might be saved except for Christ Jesus. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. No person goes to the Father or goes to heaven except through Jesus. So that's the first and foremost reason to depend upon God is for our personal salvation. Again, no one can, can uh, give you salvation by proxy, all right? You, you can't um, save someone on their behalf. It's, it's a personal relationship with Christ that saves you. Accepting his free gift a forgiveness of all your sins. You know, but all too often we're, we're so busy. We're, you know, our 24-7 schedule of work and entertainment and binging entire seasons, you know, you know without sleeping at night. And, you know, it, our dependence upon God is like buying a concert ticket and then just putting it in the junk drawer. You all have a junk drawer, right? Yeah, it's just, you put it in the junk drawer, and, and it's there when you need it. You know, it's, when you need it for admittance, it's, you know, it's there. If you can find it, things tend to get lost in junk drawers. But, um, you know, but, but that's why the second reason is so important. The first reason we need to depend upon God is salvation, but the second reason is strength. Strength. Let's face it. Becoming a Christian certainly doesn't guarantee a life of luxury. In fact, the less popular Christianity is in our culture, the more we need to depend upon God that we can overcome ridicule, even persecution, or or being left out or slighted just because of our faith. But besides needing God's strength to overcome the world, we also need God's strength to overcome ourselves, that is, to overcome our own human nature, 
our own sinful nature. And to do that, we have to depend upon the strength afforded us by the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Paul writes in his letter to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting one another. How often are they fighting one another? Constantly. How often do we need the strength of the Lord? Constantly. We need to depend upon the Lord constantly. Now, no, our basement isn't going to flood every day. Thank God. But there is a battle that goes in our mind every day. So we need to depend upon God every day. We need to live our lives in dependence upon God. And when we do, listen to what happens. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. It isn't something that we muster up. We're not born with the with the desire to automatically want to, to give to people, to, to love people, to, to share. No, those are things that the Holy Spirit does as a work within us. But it's because we're connected with God that he's able to give that to us. If a pipe wasn't connected to its source, then nothing can flow through that pipe. So unless we're connected to God, the love that he gives, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the patience, all these things that we need that we don't have in and of ourselves, they can't come to us unless we're attached, unless we're dependent upon, unless we're sustained upon God, from whom all blessings flow. And... When I say from whom all blessings flow, it's not just to us. You see, the third S, the third reason we need to depend upon God, isn't what we might think because it's not something that's done to us or for us, but rather it's our dependence upon God to enable us to do something for others. You see, by being connected to God from whom all blessings flow, that love, peace, joy, patience, those things flow to us and through us to others. And so the third S is service. You see, it's God who grants us our gifts and talents, our, our aptitudes and our intellects, our skills and abilities. Why? Well, not just to earn a paycheck so we can feed our family, but it's so we can serve one another. All of us are different. And, and we delight in, in the uniqueness that we all have. Because God could have chose, chosen to make us all able to do one thing great. But all of us do different things great. Ever wonder why not everyone works in the same occupation? I mean, why wouldn't everyone just work in the five top paying uh, occupations? I mean, it seems rather pragmatic, don't you think? Well, we're not all wired the same way. We don't have the same personalities. We don't have the same preferences, the same drives, the same intellects, the same abilities and skills. But guess what? When we're all put together, every skill, every ability that is necessary 
to do the work of the ministry is present among us all. In fact, because we all have different preferences, the people who have the ability to do something often enjoy doing it. So much more than the person who may not have that ability or they just frankly don't like doing it, but there's someone who really does does like doing it. Some people love to decorate. They love to hang streamers. They love to, to buy balloons. They love to put things on ceilings and things on tables. And they, they love, they live for that. God bless you. <laughs> There's other people who love to read and to study and, and, to, um, and to share knowledge. They love to teach. God bless you. There are people who are good mechanically, um, engineering and mechanics and, and math and science. And, you know, all of us have different skills. But put together, we all have something to share. The thing is, is that we need to do it. It's one thing to have skills and abilities and talents and to just not do anything with them? Listen to what it says in James chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. James writes in his letter, Now someone may argue, some people have faith, and others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Now what's he saying? Not that we're saved by good works. That's, that was accomplished by Jesus on the cross. But though we're not saved by good works, we are indeed saved for good works. And in order to accomplish those good works, we must depend upon God who provides for us All that we need. See, our skills, our abilities, that all comes from God. The person that stands up and says, I'm a self-made man. They're kidding themselves. They didn't make themselves. God made them. And if they think that they they built their business with their own two hands, well, who gave them the knowledge to do that? Who gave them their hands? No, we are dependent upon God for every ability and every opportunity that is before us. How many have ever been rock climbing? That many of you. You're my people. (laughs) No, I haven't either, but I did look it up, and it's a really good illustration, not because I've done it, but hear me out. Uh, all of you have your bulletin, and you saw the picture, uh, the graphic that I created for this um, message. And you see a climber, um, and you see the rope going down to a person down below. And that person is called a belayer. Um, maybe you can put, uh, put that graphic up on the screen. There it is. So you see the person in the foreground... He's tied to the rope, and that is fastened uh, to the rock upon which he's climbing. And then way down below is a person in a harness holding the rope, and he is the belayer. And there's a partnership between that person, who is the climber, and the person below, who is the belayer. And they depend upon one another. The climber depends upon the belayer for the amount of slack and the amount of tension that is given him so that he shouldn't fall if he loses his footing. Also, in the very first, in the beginning of the foreground, right below the word dependence, you see the the stake that's, that's inside the rock, that's connected to the rock. That's the security that is in that rock. Well, typically, every roped climber has that partner performing that critical role, the belayer. He skillfully handles that rope, and he he can be relied upon to catch the climber 
should he fall? In fact, there's, there's certain words or phrases that the two of them use one to another. When the climber is ready to, ready to begin this ascent, he says, on belay? And the belayer will say, belay on. And then the climber will begin climbing, and, and the belayer, he'll say, climbing. The belayer will say, climb on. If he needs a little slack, he'll say, slack. And the belayer will, will pay out some rope. If he says, up rope, then, you know, he'll pull some, some slack back. But here's one phrase that is of importance, and that is when the climber yells to the belayer below, Tension. Tension! And the belayer says, gotcha! I mean, this is what they say to each other. Um, See, when that climber yells tension, the belayer removes all the slack and holds on to the rope. And that rope is now taut. And so when the rope is taut, the climber can actually rest. They can relax because the rope will support him. You know, before Jesus ascended, he promised that he would give a comforter, a helper. And that is the Holy Spirit. And we just read what the Holy Spirit produces in our lives, but we need to depend upon the Holy Spirit. See, God will say, I got you. He'll he'll take up the slack and we can rest. But some of us, we don't take advantage of that rest. You know, God instituted a long time ago something called a Sabbath, a day of rest. And when he created the world and everything in it, In six days, on the seventh day, he rested. And if we think that we can't, then basically we're saying, Holy Spirit, my belayer, I don't trust you down there to keep the rope tension strong enough to support me while I rest. Would we do that? No. God wants us to rest and he gives us that opportunity to do that. He supports us. There's other phrases when it comes to lowering and, you know, belay on, belay off, but there's a partnership and there's communication and you see, if we're, to have independ- if we're to have dependence upon God, there must be communication with us and God likewise. How do we communicate to God? Through prayer. How does God communicate with us? Mostly, it's through his word, the Bible. But we need to make time to do that. We have to have a communication if we're going to have a connection. Remember the word depend means to connect to? Well, in order for there to be a connection, there also needs to be communication. And that comes through prayer and reading your Bible. Now, the second thing I want to look at is not only do we need to depend upon God, but we also need to be able to depend upon one another. And, and all of us together, collectively, when I say one another, I mean all of us together as the church. You see, God is the rock, but the church is founded on the rock. The church is founded on the rock. And Jesus instituted the church just before he went to the cross. Before he began his walk toward Jerusalem, 
to go to the cross, to die for our sins. He met with his disciples. And we're going to pick up in Matthew 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say I am? You know, people are still asking that question today. Who is Jesus? We need to ask ourselves, who is Jesus to us? Simon Peter, never afraid to to open his mouth um, as a spokesperson of the 12, he said, but you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, when he said Christ, that, that means Messiah. And everyone was waiting for the Messiah. All the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, they were waiting for the Messiah. But their idea of a Messiah was one who would crush Rome under his feet and set up a, a political kingdom on earth. They didn't realize that Jesus was to be the suffering servant who would die for their sins and the sins of the world. But Peter also says, not only you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. That ascribed to him deity. Basically, Peter says, you are God. He recognized Jesus as God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, Jesus, or excuse me, Peter received uh, a divine knowledge in recognizing Jesus as God. So whereas Peter says, you are the son of the living God, Jesus says to Peter, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And when Peter says, you are the Christ, He's saying, you're the Messiah. You're, you're our, you are the rock. Okay, we've already seen that in the Old Testament. That's, that, wasn't, that wasn't anything new to Peter. But then Jesus says to Peter, you're right, I am the rock. But you are Peter, little rock. See, rock is Petros. It's Greek. But Peter's name is Petra in Greek, which means little rock or stone. So it's as though Jesus is saying, yes, I am the rock, but you are the little rock. You're a living rock. You say, I am the living God? That is true. You are a living stone. And you're going to be the first of many living stones that are going to build my church. And it's upon this fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that the church is built. That's why B is the church is founded on the rock. It's founded upon Jesus. And Peter was, in fact, the the first of the apostles to bring the good news of Jesus both to Jews and to Greeks. So he was the first to, to make other living stones, little rocks to build the church. And you know what? We're still doing that today. See, living rocks are the building material of Jesus' church. And Peter himself calls Christians living stones who serve as the building material for the spiritual house and priesthood. We're all living stones. And what do stones do? They build up. What are we to do to one another? Build one another up. Listen to what Peter writes in his first letter, beginning in chapter 2, verse 4. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. Who's the living cornerstone? Christ, son of the living God, the Petros, the living cornerstone. 
He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. He goes on to say, and you are living stones. That's us Christians. Living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his royal priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. Jesus is the cornerstone. And we are living stones. Jesus is the Petros. We're the Petras. But we're living stones, building upon one another, for one another. Why? Well, just like we asked, why depend upon Jesus? And we looked at three reasons why we need to depend on him. I may say why we always need to depend on him. The second thing is, why the church? Why do we depend upon the church? Why do we need the church? Well, there's four reasons. And these all begin with the same letter also, to help you remember. The first is witness. Witness. To be an agency of God for evangelizing the world. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we know this as the Great Commission. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on, in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We're to be a witness to everyone in the world that they may know Jesus themselves. The second is worship. To be a corporate body in which we may worship God together. Now here's the thing. You may say, well, I can worship God anywhere. Why do I got to come to church? I can worship God in the park. I can worship God while I'm driving my car. I can worship God in bed. Well, maybe so, but you're only one part. And you need to recognize that you are a part of many. Let me say that again. The problem that we have often with the church is that we don't recognize that we are a part of many. Which is why we need to gather together as a church, that's the word ecclesia, which means an assembly, a gathering. It's why we need to come together as a corporate body to worship because we're many parts that need to come together to make a whole. 1 Corinthians 12 12 and 13. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. We need to be in church. We need to worship God as a corporate body. We need to remember that we are only one member of the body of Christ. So we need to come together to be that body of Christ. Why? Well, one of the reasons is, number three, to walk. Walk. To be a channel of God's purpose to build a body of saints being perfected in the image of his Son. In Ephesians 4, beginning at 11, we read, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Well, let's stop there. Build up. Living stones. 
But now we have this equipping, this teaching, this training. If we're going to walk, there's the W word, if we're going to walk this Christian life, we need to be equipped. We need to hear God's message preached. We need to hear so that we can be equipped to walk the life that God has for us. So we won't stumble, so we won't fall. It closes with this in the passage. Christ, who is the head of his body, the church, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Each of us are but a part. And all of these parts, all of us, need to come together. We need to depend upon one another. But that's within this church. The fourth and final reason we need the church is not for ourselves, but it's outside these four walls. See, we're not just the church where we're In the sanctuary, when we're in this building, yes, this building isn't the church. Yes, we are the church. We established that. But we're also the church when we're outside of the church. Do you get me? Because the fourth word is work. To be a people who demonstrate God's love and compassion to all the world, outside these four walls, in the community, in the grocery store, Inviting the teller at the bank or the cashier at the restaurant or the waitress or someone you see, a friend of yours, someone that you meet. God will provide the opportunity. But if we are to be about our Father's business, it can't be restricted to just within the building that we call the church. We need to be the church outside into the world. Let me read Galatians 6, beginning in 7. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired doing what is good, At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. Now, he separates the family of faith from good to everyone. It's it's sort of shining a spotlight to reiterate that it's not only to fellow Christians we're to do good, it's to people outside of the church, the people who need to be shown God's love and acceptance. So we need the church. We need one another. In closing, I'd like for all of you to to pick up your little rope. All of you should have received uh, this little rope when you came in. And I'd like you just to Hold the top end of it. And imagine this, as you see in the graphic, that it is fastened to, it is connected to the rock who is Jesus. And ask yourself, am I depending on Jesus? Am I connected to Jesus? Am I relying upon Jesus? Am I communicating with Jesus through prayer and a study of his word? Am I firmly anchored in God, the rock of my salvation? You know, if you can't confidently answer yes to those questions, then today is your day. It's your day to commit your life to Christ. If you're watching online and and you've not committed your life to Christ and you're saying, well, yeah, I need to depend upon Christ, I, I don't know how. It's very simple. If you would pray with me, it could be in your own words, but it's simply asking Jesus to be the master and ruler of your life. 
Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize my need for you. My dependence of you every day, all day. Lord, I know that I am dependent upon you to to come to heaven because you said that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to heaven except through you and by you. So, Lord, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Lord, I make you the Lord, the ruler, the master of my life. I commit myself to you, and I will live my life for you. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins and be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, while you're holding the top end, look at the bottom end. You notice there's no one holding the bottom end. Well, that's right. So I want you to think of this as a lifeline. Who do you know who needs a lifeline to Jesus? Who do you know who needs to take hold of this other end? Who do you know who's lost and needs direction? Who's broken and needs healing? Who's rejected and needs acceptance? Who do you know who needs the love of Christ, the peace of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ? Will you be a lifeline? Now, while holding the top of the rope, hold the bottom of the rope with your other hand and then pull the rope taut. You see how that rope is is strong and holds one end to the other. And remember our illustration of the partnership between the climber and the belayer. And ask yourself, who's my belayer? Who takes up the slack when I need help? Who supports me when I need rest? Who encourages me to keep climbing higher and not give up? We all need a belayer in our life. A prayer partner, accountability partner, someone whom we can depend upon. And finally, while holding both ends, flip it top to bottom and ask yourself, to whom am I a belayer? To whom do I take up the slack when they need help? To whom do I support when they need rest? And to whom do I encourage to keep climbing higher and not give up? I have left some growth work for you. And what I'd like you to do is take this home. Take this little rope and put it on your refrigerator, um, on your bathroom mirror, maybe next to your alarm clock at the side of your bed. And every time you see it, I want you to remember these three things. Number one, connect with Jesus. Connect with Jesus. Be bound in Christ. Remember, to rely means to bind. Be bound in Christ. And I'd like you to fill this in. I will read my Bible and pray each day at. Come up with a time. Every day. When you hit snooze and you kind of feel this, you're like, oh, yes, there's that rope. You know what? I got to pray. I got to pray. Let it be a reminder to pray daily because to have connection also means having communication. Number two, connect with lost people. Connect with lost people. We connect with Jesus. We we are bound in Christ. Connect with lost people and be a lifeline in the world. You know, we often test a rope, tug on a rope to make sure that it's it will hold us, that it that it won't give. Right? Well, if we're gonna be a lifeline, 
be prepared that people are going to tug on it and they're going to see if you're the real deal. They're going to test you. They're going to test your sincerity. And hopefully, you won't fail. Because people don't care how much you know unless they what? Know how much you care. If you're being willing to extend a lifeline, expect them to tug it and know that that tugging is going to be proof to how tight you are connected to Christ. Because if you're not connected to Christ, they're going to realize that it's not you that they're dependent upon. It's Christ in you. And if you're not connected in Christ and dependent upon his strength, then how can someone else depend upon Christ whom you're connected with? The last is connect with fellow believers. Connect with fellow believers. Be a servant in ministry. You know, in order to connect with fellow believers, you got to be in church. You can't connect with fellow believers if you stay home. Now, for those of you who need to stay home because of, of sickness or, or something or uh, whatever reason, you know, God bless you. We're so grateful that we have this technology to bring this message to you. But for those of you who can gather together in corporate worship, connect with fellow believers. It's how we can depend upon one another when we are together as a church. So the last question is, I will inquire about volunteering at Woodland Inn. It could be youth ministry, children's ministry, fine arts ministry, you know, helping in something. Maybe, maybe it's once in a great while. Boy, I would love to teach you how to advance slides. Um, it, it really isn't that hard. And, you know, so we can see up on the screen um, the lyrics and the sermon notes. But all of us have a place. Take this home Use this as a reminder to connect with Jesus, connect with lost people, and connect with fellow believers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth in your word. Lord, we thank you that we can trust you, depend upon you, rely upon you. But Lord, we need to also rely upon one another. Lord, you founded the church on the rock, and you are the rock. We are living stones that build one another up, building your church. May we be your church to one another in ministry and outside these four walls to others so that your church may grow and people would know you as their Savior. Thank you, Father God. We love you. We depend on you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day today.